Welcome to another episode of History on the Hill. My name is Monique Sugimoto. I'm the archivist and local history librarian. And today we have in studio. In <laughs> your studio. In our studio here in the library, Maria Sereo. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so exciting and such a pleasure to be with you because we've been talking about the 50th anniversary yeah. of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes now for almost a year, or more than a year. It's been more than a year. It yeah. has. And I thought it would be so fun to come here and use your expertise to tell us about some of these historical events that we've been talking about because I would say this is the busiest little city I've ever seen. It is the busiest little city. It's, well, the biggest little city here on the, on the peninsula, but yes, yes. it has been um, quite a busy time. It really has, yeah. and it's so interesting because you and I have talked about when they incorporated back in 1973. Right. and. They really had a they had a focus and they had goals that they wanted to do. Tell us a little bit more about that, why that was so important. Well, I think to, the reason why that was so important is we also have to look back and say what was going on in L.A. County at that time and what was happening here on the peninsula. Um, we already had the other three cities on the peninsula incorporated um, and we had this big swath of land um, that was eventually becoming Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, but development was happening at a clip that was just crazy. And as you know, in the late 50s and early 60s, there was just development all over the place. And um, give it credit to the, um, the residents at that time who said, no, let's have, have a little bit more local control of our community. Mm -hmm. And there were, according to Ken Dida, the three pillars of open space, low density, and views. And if you kind of look back, you can see that that has been maintained, that those three things um, have kind of gone over time. Um, and it's kind of developed as the city, or it's kind of been the guiding um, parts of part of the city and how it's come about. And it's always really amazed me that the city has stayed that way basically in uh -huh. the last 50 years that they've kept low density, uh -huh. not a lot of people, the same amount roughly mm -hmm. that were here 50 years ago. And I'm um, bringing up Ken Dida, one of our city founders. Yeah. I know over the years, you here at the library, you've received collections from him. Tell us about that. I know we did a show with him that you did. Yes, yes. yes. Um, when I first started working here back in 2012 or so, I think it was about within a year, um, Ken had contacted me and said that he had 20 or so boxes in his garage um, on the incorporation. And we had a small collection of Save Our Coastline materials, mm -hmm. you know, the, the effort that led eventually into the city. Um, and he said, would you be interested in, in seeing these boxes? And I said, sure. So I went over to his garage <laughs> and he threw open the garage and pulled out that great old car that he has. And, um, you know, a couple of, I think it was maybe four or five visits to his house. Um, and just slowly I brought the boxes over here. Um, and so now we're rehousing them. Um, I mean, it, it's been a really long project because I have been alone. Um, and uh, it takes a little bit of time to, uh, to go through and to arrange um, all of the materials. But they basically document um, that whole coastline effort, the uh, Save Our Coastline effort and the Fort City Incorporation effort. It's amazing how long that took and really how forceful they were as a group to say, we this is what we want and we're not going to take anything less. We're yes. going to stick to our guns. Yes. And, um, you know, with organizations like the League of Women um, Voters, mm -hmm. um, with their coordinating and their coordination efforts and other people who were, you know, part of the, uh, part of the uh, initial efforts, they really did um, just kept going back and going back and going back until they were able to succeed. And it's really, um, I think, an example of community activism and not, and today that might have a negative connotation. I don't mean it as a negative no, connotation. No, it was really important. It, it was really important yeah. to, um, to do, but, you know, citizens, if you just step back a second, um, residents and citizens caring for their own community, mm -hmm. so much so that they would do this type of effort, I think is really, um, th everybody who's involved should be applauded for that. Effort. And especially since it took so many legal maneuvers and, yes. and people trying to listen to what was going on and then they had to go back to court again and 
we went through it once and I, God bless Ken yeah. because he really had the patience of mm -hmm. a saint to be able to and everybody on the council, everybody, really, I think you know. Everybody on the council. I mean, if you, um, you know, you go back and you. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm looking at um, organizational charts yes. and a speakers bureau where people were assigned to go out and talk. Organizing, you know, um, rides and buses for people to go to the um, the, uh, the the supervisors' meetings and mm -hmm. whatnot. That's. That's pretty incredible, I think. It, it was the beginning of social media, I guess, yeah. right? <laughs> social, social media, media by just communities together. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think even before people knew what Rancho Palos Verdes was, everybody mm -hmm. knew what Marine Land was because it was yep. such a gem here in our community. Tell yes. us about that. Um, I think that is really an important um, kind of, you know, history or part of the history of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be um, selected, for the peninsula to be selected as an oceanarium, you know, the place to have this um, spectacular facility as it was at the time. I mean, that was, um, you know, for its day, it yeah. was a really important piece. And, and people, it wasn't just people on the peninsula who frequented uh, marine land. People came from all over to go to marine land. That was, I mean, it was a significant. Um, it was a destination. It was a destination, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was a destination. And we learned that even Hollywood, with all of the TV shows like The Munsters That's right. and Wonder Woman. Right, That's so right. So many shows said, hey, let's go to marine land and incorporate the Addams Family and yep. incorporate episodes, you know, to have marine land as a backdrop. So mm -hmm. it was just such a popular place to come to for people. It was a very popular place. In, in fact, just a couple of um, months ago, I put in a photograph of Sergei um, Tenge, who was the um, the first mountaineer to climb Everest, I believe that's who it was. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that he wanted to do was to go to Marine Land. Really? And so one of the local residents in Rolling Hills, um, Don Crocker, oh, so yes. a former um, yeah. you know, mayor of yeah. uh, Rolling Hills, he took, or his wife, um, arranged for um, Tenge to go to Marine Land. And there's a picture of him um, in Marine Land. And that so that is, is now part of our digital repository. So We've actually added that in. And it's so interesting to me how you get random things all the time like that. People yes. bringing things in <laughs> that have something to do with this area. Yes, yes, it's absolutely true. And you never know. Um, that that's kind of how archives work, um, especially community archives, that there's just stuff in a, in a garage or an attic yeah. and suddenly, you know, the person or the homeowner is moving or something is happening and you look through it and oh, you've got all this really interesting stuff there. Yes, you and know, it's really I, fun. I think another really interesting point that you and I have talked about before too is the fact that where um, the Rancho Palos Verde City Hall is now was yes. a very historic site. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. Well, I just, you know, when you look at that site, um, we know that uh, it was used for military purposes mm -hmm. um, from World War, you know, II uh, on and even into the Cold War. Um, you have uh, in that area gun emplacements. You also have just past City Hall and looking out towards the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. um, you have um, that big metal door out there, which is amazing. That yes. says World War II. I mean, you can't get in there, but that's a, you know, the bunker. Right. Um, not owned by the city, but still. I mean, yes. it's still um, just right accessible from the city site. Um, and then during the Cold War, when um, you know there was a, a control site um, there and the Nike missile silo where they could, you know, um, where the missiles were housed. I mean, that's truly amazing that that is there. It is. And that the city was able to um, acquire that property and then move in. When did they move in? Wasn't it 75 or something? Something right around there, That yes. they moved mm -hmm. in and that the site has remained basically untouched. Yes. <laughs> you know, since the city acquired it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I know that the city right now is doing a, the Civic Center and trying um, doing that. I hope in some way that that is incorporated the history or there's a nod to the history just because it's so. It I think it's just so interesting. Yes, and I mean, I'm, what other city? I mean, that's also a research project. What other city can say that they have that? They still have intact. that history. Yes, yeah, still intact, mm -hmm. and also that's part of their history. I and, don't think so. And I know earlier this year you had a uh, library did the doors open peninsula yes. project mm -hmm. where. There were so many areas and different landmarks that were open for the day so people could see it. And one of them was that. Yes. Was the silo. And 
there was a steady stream of people all day long. They couldn't wait to see it. I just think that is so amazing. And in fact, when I, I did a survey of um, people who attended, and then also all of the participating organizations, and um, hands down, the Nike Missile Silo was one of the places that everybody really wanted to visit. Yeah. Um, they were like, I can't believe that this is there. And mm -hmm. you know what was also really cool was people, people would go to the site and then would go to another site and say, hey, I just saw you over at the missile oh. silo, <laughs> which was kind of fun. That, that is fun. You know, that they, you know, they're at the, you know, the lighthouse and then they're up mm -hmm. at the silo and, um, but being able to go into that basically untouched as it was, uh, your, it, in its original state is really amazing. History in our own backyard, that's on our own for back sure, and, right? And exactly, yeah. yeah. So that was really fun to do that project. Yeah, and the 70s were really so busy when we talk about all these things with the city incorporating and, and marine land, and that kind of went on for a while. And then the city itself, uh, you know, with the whale watching being so popular yes. up here, and starting Well of a Day event, yeah. and the back of uh, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center was that back patio where the census takers started to watch the whales mm -hmm. and count. And I remember the first time I came up here, I'm like, what are they doing back there? Yes. But they're dedicated and they want to see which whales and they know all about the migration. When did that become so popular? Gosh, that's such a good question. Well, um, isn't it in the 80s though? I think that so. I think the um, that started in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, and then the the uh, the center was created there in the 80s too, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and then it was rebuilt a little bit, uh, or there had to be remediation redone. Mm -hmm. or redone a little bit later. Um, but yeah, one of the premier places for the um, you know for whale watching. Yes. Um, right there on our shore. I mean, it's just it's really fun to walk around and it just is. be, you know, you see the locals there, the guy with his turtle. Yeah. Was there. <laughs> oh yes, the guy with the turtle, yeah. Yeah, what is the turtle's name? I can't remember, he's got some interesting name. But. We'll have to think about that. Yeah. But yeah, but, but he comes all the time. I think every day he's there. He's, a, he's there every day with his turtle. Because you have to walk the turtle. Because you have to walk the turtle. When you have a turtle that big, you have to yeah, walk. You have to walk the turtle. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It, yes. Uh, and it's such a beautiful area. No matter <laughs> who is. goes down to that, where the lighthouse is. And yes. that was another area on the mm -hmm. the 100 years for the it doors was. open. Yes. Yes. That was another um, area. And uh, when I started um, doing the coordination for the project, mm -hmm. the lighthouse hadn't opened up yet right. um, to the public. They had been and closed for a long time. They had been closed because of COVID and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I called them, I was like, this is the big coup that we could it really get was. Um, the lighthouse to be open. And do you know that they had over 600 people on that day coming through? And um, the the Doe Center, the person who was there, kind of, you know, the, the person who does it um, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for the lighthouse said that there were even people showing up who were had lived on the peninsula for over 50 years and had not been to the lighthouse. That's impressive. It's pretty incredible. It really yeah, is. Yeah, so I just really liked seeing and, and learning about that. Mm -hmm. You and know, that yeah. our community, you might have lived here for a long time, but you haven't gone out and explored and, and that was kind of a, a fun kind of part of the project was to be able to do that. And you know, isn't that really true? There's so many things in our own backyard, as we say, that we yeah. don't know about. Yeah. And that's one of them for sure. That is totally one of them. Yeah, yeah. that big lighthouse just sitting there. That just all sitting out there. <laughs> um, and uh, but what's also interesting about the lighthouse, with, that lighthouse in particular, is um, the way it's designed. Yeah. Um, because it is kind of that stucco wall mm -hmm. and the um, and the roof, and it was designed that way in the 20s because to match the way the peninsula was being developed right. at that time. And at first, the keeper of the lighthouses did not want to do that. They had some you know, other other plan for lighthouses, but they said, no, can we please do this? And Walter Swindle Davis developed the uh, the plans. That's I mean, amazing. It is. It's truly amazing. And then another, of course, amazing um, landmark is the Wayfarers Chapel. Yes, yes, the Wayfarers Chapel. Yes, that's another one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just digitize for everybody who's not aware of this, um, but we, we've had the oral history with um, Frank Lloyd Wright um, done for a long time. Wow. But now I have it in the library's catalog and you can actually listen to it um, online and search through the transcript. And it's an interesting interview. It was done just a couple of years before he passed away um, with Ralph Jester, um, with Ralph Jester, um, who was a Portuguese then. But he, the section in this where he says how inspired he was when he went to Northern California and he said this is what he wanted to make here right. and here it is. Like yeah. you were sitting amongst the trees 
in this glass house. It's a really interesting interview in a beautiful, beautiful place. And like you said, it's so interesting because when you're there, you you feel like you're in a different place. Yes. You look over and see the water, but while you're inside, of whether it's the chapel or just where the trees are, you really do feel like you're in it in another place. You're in a completely different place. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, it's a really it's interesting. I learned so much about um, the chapel through that um, interview. Yeah. And just the placement of the cross, it's not inside, it's actually outside. That's There's right. just a really uh, interesting place. A lot of history there, that's for yes. sure. They, I, I think as the as the peninsula started to grow, they were still so concerned with the, the, the city about um, the low density and uh -huh. really preserving the land. And I know the Land Conservancy came yes. into the picture. Yes. Tell us more about that. I, you know, another uh, com heroic community effort in my view um, with Bill and Barb Ayler, who mm -hmm. started the Land Conservancy with other um, community members, um, but just wanting to maintain that open space, mm -hmm. um, you know, for generations to come. and. Uh, and here we have it. I mean, mm -hmm. so going from, you know, the, the establishment of the Conservancy and now um, I think they're, what, at 1,700 acres yeah. on the peninsula? Yeah. I mean, we're 16,000 acres and, I, you know, I say this every single time I give a, a talk on um, the development of the peninsula, but where else in L.A. County do you have a space like what we have Very mostly here? Few, I mean, yeah. you know, that is this protected open space. Right. Um, I think that's extraordinary. I, I agree, and there are people that really fought for that, and they still yeah. do, because mm -hmm. think about it, with the coastline that we have, mm -hmm. I mean, it could be built up in two seconds, but they said, no, this was what the original founders wanted, this is what the residents wanted. Right. This is when the city was created, yeah. Yeah, exactly. and so we're gonna keep it that way. And, it, and interestingly enough, when Marineland closed and Terranea yeah. opened as a result, that was such a beloved place, and I know that there were so many people that were so sad to see Marine Land close. Mm -hmm. But when Terranea was born, which we'll talk a little bit more about, they really wanted to make sure that the land was still preserved, mm -hmm. even within the even within the resort. You know, the with the right uh, plants right. and the native plants and the things right. that were already here per se. Right. Because you wanted to keep that that uh, all the natural all the natural history. Right. Of the place. I mean, mm -hmm. so even if you're parking at um, what is that little turnout that's right at right before you get to Terranea? Um, Pelican, uh, Pelican Cove or something? something. I think that's what it is. Where you, you can park there and walk down that path, right? Yes. Or you can, you know, go down that path over mm -hmm. towards Nelson's, which we do a lot. Right. Yeah. Um, or even sit in Nelson's and watch the so dolphins beautiful. and the and the whales go by. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that was an important piece of of maintaining, um, yeah, the character um, and wanting to reestablish um, the the natural. Uh, sage, coastal sage shrub. Okay, that's a that's a difficult thing for for me to say because it has a lot of S's. That's a tough one. Yeah, okay. it is. <laughs> but yeah, I think that mm -hmm. just to make sure that they did that and that was like so important to them, um, mm -hmm. obviously. And then as as time went on and they decided to build the golf course back in the '90s, it was Ocean Trails. Oh, you mean Ocean Trails? Uh, yes, yeah. down the road. Yes, um, because it always amazed me how because they're so careful not to build, but. And Terranea took a long time to build, even after uh -huh. Marineland closed. It went on for a long time before right. they said, okay, we, this is the group, we're going, we, right. we trust is... them, that it's going to be exactly as they said. And right. because it really, it could have gone in a million different directions. And I think they were very careful for it not to. Uh -huh. um, but then when Ocean Trails was created, um, that was the the Pete Dye course. Uh -huh. And they, they put this all together and the two brothers, uh huh. Zuckermans. The Zuckermans, mm -hmm. yes, that that built it, and lo and behold, the 18th hole falls into the ocean a week before it was going to open. A week before it's going to open, it just falls into the ocean, and then the, what is the cause of it? Um, you know that whole investigation. Um, boy, what a fiasco that was. Um, well, I mean, just yes, uh, just the uh, the aftermath. It's not fiasco, but the aftermath of the 18th hole going in because that was a lot of land coming off. A lot. And what do you do with it? And what mm -hmm. about um, you know the shore access on the other side? And right. what's going to happen to that? Um, the lawsuits. So that was quite some time before. Um, it, it had its next. Yes, um, it's <laughs> rebirth. Next, what happened? It's, 
<laughs> its next <laughs> chapter. Right. Which yeah. means that, yes, Donald Trump came along and he yeah. bought it and then spent $30 million to fix the 18th hole, which yeah. I always thought was. He said it's the most stable piece of land. You could stand on it and an 8.0 earthquake could shake and that piece of land will not move. move so yes. that's where we all need to go if there's an yes. earthquake here. Right. Uh, but that kind of brings up another point too, and that's yeah. the landslide. And oh yeah, That the has landslide. been going on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to talk about because it it's is. just been going on for such for a long time. Years, for yes. many, many years. And, um, you know, was it um, drainage? Uh, was it sewage? Was it uh, because of um, the Crenshaw coming through mm -hmm. and, you know, and the pressures that were going on in there? And then the subsequent, you know, condemnation of houses and not being able to, and then, then just the constant movement, the moving of PV Drive South, right? Um, which, it, you know, just in and of itself is, um, is incredible. And I, I think just recently there were changes to whatever the zones are. I mean, when you're in Portuguese Bend, it's, uh, it's a different, uh, you need to really understand where you are right. in that overlay zone if you're going to be building or not building um, um, and just working with the city and the city just getting recently the federal um, mm -hmm. funds right. to help stabilize and um, and work on that I think is amazing. I, and yeah. I remember even when I first started out here and I asked somebody I said why don't they just fix that and they're, it's a little more complicated than just fixing it. Yeah. There's so much going on there. So much going on. And then the dewatering wells or watering wells, whichever one you call, and then the constant, um, mm -hmm. and then utilities are above ground, right? Yes. Um, things, uh, well, you can always see it if you're going down PV Drive South. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a tough nut to crack on how it to is, how it? to really uh, remediate it. And, and because it's been there for so long. I mean, it's not just, you know, since the 50s. And it's much longer. And one of the only places on the earth that is exactly like oh, that. Oh, yes, that's what you were so saying. That, that there are no other cities um, that have an active landslide right. in them. So which they're is, constantly working to figure it out, I guess. History in our own backyard. Right, yeah. <laughs> we were saying. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, there's there's really just been so much over time. I mean, yeah. from Hitano Farm. Yes, and just um, a new historic designation mm -hmm. with, this, with the state. Right. Um, which I think was a really important thing for the city to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a, I mean, a, as recognizing that this was the last Japanese, you know, farm yes. um, on the peninsula, even though it was after um, you know, internment and the Hatano came um, in the 50s, but I think it just represents um, that uh, that community that was here, mm -hmm. and the uh, you know that it gives a nod to our our our, our, our agricultural past. Right. Um, you know, so I think there, the important part is that um, you know it is being um, preserved, but I think that it's also um, helping with the city now. Um, go in its next step with the uh, Civic Center and just making right. sure all of its ducks are in a row um, to be able to do that. But what an amazing, amazing place, really, mm -hmm. um, you know, to walk around there, to have the Conservancy, or, you know, Alta Vicente, and walking in that area. It, it's really spectacular. And I know it was one of the many projects that you have had here uh -huh. was the, we need to talk about the, the oh, Japanese, the, the family. Uh -huh, the 40 Families Project. Yes, and mm -hmm. it was one of the first shows I think you did. I think it was. How did that come about? So that, the 40 Families Project um, is based on the photograph mm -hmm. um, and it was actually my predecessor, um, Marjean Blinn, who mm -hmm. saw that photograph and she was mesmerized by it. She's also very much interested in family history. Mm -hmm. And she said, let's start a project to identify everybody in the photograph. Amazing. And the photograph is from 1923. So this is 20 years ago she started this. And um, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of the people who are in the photograph or their children were still alive. Um, and they put out a call to the community and asked um, the community to come and see if they recognized anybody in the photograph. And they. They did, you know, they got as much as they could. Mm -hmm. You know, fast forward, you know, 20 some odd years later, and um, now we're talking about grand, great grandchildren, um, you know, and, and the photograph. So we're getting less recognition right. of the, you know, of, of identifying the people. But we're still at 67%, which is great. That's pretty amazing yeah. considering it was 100 years ago. It was 100 years ago that that photograph was taken. Um, and Richard Kawasaki, who did a project with us, um, has been it, with the project since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And you know, he on he is on Facebook, and he's contacting families. And even you know, now we get photographs from 
the families. I scan them and then we send them back. Um, it's amazing. So that we can, you know, preserve this history. And you have yeah. so many interesting projects also that come to you like this one. Tell oh, us yeah. about this. <laughs> this one. Yes. So this, the mystery folder. The, the mystery folder on the <laughs> table. Yeah. Yes. It's actually this really interesting little collection that I um, finished processing um, just a couple of days ago. And it is from about 100 years ago um, in the 1920s when the Palos Verdes Project started selling off land. Just prior to that, there was a group of people who were encouraging people to homestead in Palos Verdes, and not just on this rancho, but in other ranchos, in Irvine, in um, Santa Monica, all over Southern California. Um, and these fraudsters, I'm just going to call them that, because right. um, they were, one of them was indicted. Um, 20, four people were indicted on 21 counts. One of them, um, sorry, yeah, they, one of them was, was um, convicted. Wow. And he was sent to McNeil, uh, McNeil Island, the penitentiary, and um, which is where he died. He fell or something, but he was appealing his case to the Supreme Court. Oh my! But during this time, <laughs> I mean, it's just a crazy thing. Um, there was a Senate um, committee that was um, convened to investigate these claims that um, these homesteaders were making, and what the claim was was that the federal government did not get this land appropriately from. Um, the, through the Mexican and Spanish land grant period, and that's why they, it was open to being homesteaded. But people, so this is the testimony. These are the transcripts from the uh, from the pro, uh, from the um, from the subcommittee hearings. It's amazing. And they finally issued their report. But how that affected us is that people were going to be buying. They were buying lots here, and they were backing out of the deal yeah. because they didn't think that they had proper title, right. um, that the title was questionable to the lot that they were buying. Um, so th this guy Kindig, who's, this is his collection, was encouraging um, the, uh, the, this committee to issue a report saying this is not valid. And how interesting that this came from, what year was this? Um, this report was from 1932. Yeah, so Again, the almost 100 years ago, yeah, 90 exactly. years ago. exactly, 90 years ago. That's unbelievable. Yeah, but this, the guy who did this was um, collecting all sorts of different writings, and one of them is, Palos Verdes is open to being homesteaded, this little pamphlet that was being you you know, sent out. No, <laughs> you know, that showing up and on your land, you're buying it, and a lot of the early buyers were not living here. They just bought. They were buying. They right? were buying, mm -hmm. you know, as investment properties, but they had the land. So, you know, you come and you have a homesteader on your land, you know, so it's just a really interesting, it's an interesting little collection. It um, is. You know, from that time period. Well, and really, again, we, we just talk about so much going on here and, and getting back to the Doors Open Peninsula project that you yeah. guys did this year. How did you decide where you were going to have open? Like, because there were so many places here. Um, to kind of go over the hundred years. So um, really, we, we took the Historical Society had um, a, a map of all of the different sites that they had um, designated as historical sites, that was one. Um, but then I just started calling the city, um, this, all the cities and saying, hey, can you open Merlot Gate Lodge? How about um, the, the, silo, the missile silo right. for RPV? For Rancho, our Rolling Hills Estates, it was you know their city council chambers. They have an amazing thing over there, and the, the Land Conservancy who had two sites. So it was really just kind of calling and you know pitching pitching the idea. It was a, it was a lot of work, but she did magnificently. I might it add. was it was so much fun. But every, what was great is everybody was so into it. Yeah, they were like yeah, sure, let's bring. There were a lot of people know, that came out for sure. Yeah, but it, even the sites that um, you know to participate. Well, Monique, thank you for having me today and let me just yes. pick your brain about all of these things. Absolutely. To talk about RPV over 50 years and even over 100 years because so much has gone on. Absolutely, and come anytime. Okay, I will. I will come back, of course. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, and thank you everybody for joining us for this episode of History on the Hill. Um, if you'd like more information about the library and the local history center, you can come to the library's website at pvld.org. Um, and we look forward to seeing you. Come on, if, if you ever have a history question, I look forward to meeting you.